Thank you all for joining us this afternoon for a very special conversation with Brittany Packnett Cunningham. My name is Laura Mishu. I'm the Executive Director of the Supportive Housing Network of New York. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we are a membership and advocacy organization promoting the development of supportive housing as the answer to homelessness for individuals with behavioral health needs. Brittany is joining us today as part of our Network Friday Forum series taking place every Friday at 1 p.m. running through early November. Next Friday, we'll have a forum on racist policies and homelessness, and the full series is on our website. We hope you have a moment to take a look and register. Today, Brittany will be giving opening remarks and then we'll be in dialogue with Tierra Labrada, our senior policy analyst, who handles social services for the team and helps to lead the network's advocacy and coalition work. We'll reserve time at the end for audience Q&A, so please feel free to leave your questions. I'm thrilled to introduce Brittany Packnett Cunningham, an award-winning activist, organizer, and educator. We had actually booked Brittany to join us in our conference this year, which of course we had to cancel. So we are delighted that we could make this happen virtually. As you all know, Brittany is a leader in the, at the intersection of culture and justice, a lifelong activist and proud member of the Ferguson Uprising. Brittany was appointed to the Ferguson Commission as well as the Task Force on 21st Century Policing by President Barack Obama. She has lent her clear and vital voice to a host of issues centering social justice and personal empowerment, especially for women and girls of color. We can think of no more important time in our history to bring her thinking and her indomitable spirit into our community. Thank you, Brittany, for joining us today. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I am so grateful to be having this conversation with um, folks who are already in the choir. I know a lot of times we talk about echo chambers and how it can be a negative thing to preach to the choir, but I will tell you as a woman of faith and the child of not one, but two preachers, um, along with my brother, that the choir sometimes needs preaching too. And that those of us who have chosen to do the work of justice in whatever capacity we have available to us and whatever our gifts draw us to, that we also are in need of truth and encouragement and love and community so that we can keep on doing the work to which we are called. Um, so I am here to hopefully share some of that light with you. I'm going to just give a couple of remarks and then I know we're going to have a, a deeper conversation. Um, but before I start doing anything, I will tell you, thank you. Thank you for joining this conversation. Thank you for choosing to spend your time thinking about these issues, working on these issues, paying attention to these issues, making a difference on these issues. And even if you're just getting started in justice work, thank you for choosing to spend this time with us to get a little bit more truth and a little bit more fuel for the fight. Um, I come to you wearing a shirt that says Black Girl Freedom from the Black Girl Freedom Fund and, and a project started by a group of incredible Black women, people like Tarana Burke, who created Me Too, and um, Fatima Goss-Graves, who is the head of the National Women's Law Center, and so much more, to raise $1 billion for Black girls. Um, and I'm wearing this shirt because I woke up with Breonna Taylor on my mind, as I'm sure lots of you did. Um, thinking about all of the ways in which those of us who not only have marginalized identities, but have more than one marginalized identity, if you are a person of color, if you are a woman, if you are gender not conforming, if you are disabled, if you are an immigrant, if you are LGBTQ+, if you are Muslim, if you are Jewish, there are so many ways that systems conspire to harm us instead of giving us the space to heal. And so I put on this shirt um, both as an affirmation to who I am and an aspiration for what I hope will uh, be true in the world, that all of us can be free um, and more free tomorrow than we're free today. And that's exactly what we're here to talk about. 
Um, I am convinced looking in this moment across the world in the middle of multiple simultaneous pandemics, the pandemic of COVID-19, the pandemic of white supremacy, the pandemic of poverty, the pandemic of militarism. I am convinced that the only way forward, the only way we build a beloved community is not through reform or reformation, but fully through transformation, through a radical imagination that challenges us to get rid of the things that no longer serve us, serve us and replace them with the things that do, to defund the things that no longer help us and to fund the things that heal us, to ensure that everything from the social services to the organiz grassroots organizations to the people who are leading households and churches and synagogues and mosques and community organizations and uh, block associations uh, and who are running mutual aid societies in the midst of all of this are getting everything that they need instead of continuously shuffling resources, time and attention to the places that are not doing as well. Transformation has to be the thing in front of us. It has to be the aspiration. It has to be what we work toward every single day because, and I will tell you this as a former educator, we will only rise as high as the bar we set for what that transformation can be. If we set the bar at reform, that's all we'll get. If we set the bar at incrementalism, that's all we'll get. But if we set the bar at transformation, if we are radical enough to believe that everyone uh, living fully and thriving fully should be the norm, then we'll get there and we'll get there together. So three things that are on my mind about what this transformation has to look like. Number one, I know that there is no new way forward if we don't tell the truth about how we got here. And homelessness and housing insecurity do not exist in a vacuum. They are unfortunately so often the culmination of multiple systems and intersections of oppression that continue to wreak havoc in the lives of our loved ones, our neighbors, our friends, the people that we pass on the street. The idea that homelessness by itself is something um, that is considered to be a scourge on our community is deeply influenced by the ways in which we treat poverty by the fact that we've actually criminalized poverty instead of created a war on poverty, we've created a war on people. That we jail folks just because they don't have a place to lay their head instead of figure out how we make a place that they can lay their head both safe and permanent for them. We know that homelessness and housing insecurity is connected deeply to systems and economies that are inequitable in our communities that looking at things like the racial wealth gap and the racial wage gap are part of what lead us to this moment, are part of what lead us to this crisis. That if we are not ensuring that living wages are being paid in all industries, we are going to continue to go round and round on this issue. That issues of policing, education, uh, joblessness, incarceration, all of these things are deeply connected to the housing crisis and the homelessness crisis in this country and frankly, all over the world. And if we are going to solve this, then we actually have to be willing to break down the silos between our organizations and our industries to get together and solve this. If we know that multiple things conspired to give, to put people in a position where they do not have homes to go to, then multiple things have to conspire correctly to correct the issue. Dr. King talks about the fact that love and power can be the thing that correct all of the things that are unjust in our world. I think that injustice is uh, something that we have to understand is never caused by just one thing, but multiple things. And therefore we have to be brave enough and imaginative enough and work in coalition enough to solve these things together. So the first thing we have to do is know that there is no way forward that is new if we don't tell the truth about how we got here. The second thing is that we have to know that solutions will be insufficient if they are not intersectional. Centering racial and social and economic work in this work of ending housing insecurity and homelessness is crucial and critical. I told everyone that I spoke with at the beginning of this COVID-19 crisis to remember that a pandemic doesn't erase inequality, 
a pandemic exacerbates inequality. And that all of the injustices and inequalities that existed before this pandemic came to be are not only spotlighted by this pandemic, but worsened by this pandemic. That the broadband internet access gap that existed before is definitely felt now. That the issues with housing and wages and essential workers that existed before certainly exist now. That the workers that were always essential are essential right now. We have to make sure that we are centering the most marginalized in our solutions. Ayanna Presley says it so well that the people closest to the pain should be the people closest to the power. So often we infantilize the people that we say we are in community with. The people that we say we stand in solidarity with, we far too often choose to operate as a savior instead of a partner. Savior complexes don't set anybody free. I already told you all I'm a girl of faith, so I only know one savior in my own life. And I don't think that anybody needs saving. I think that what people need is to be able to access the power that already lives inside of them and access the resources that should be equally available to all of us. In order to create solutions for housing insecurity and homelessness that are fully sufficient and that don't need to be corrected time and again, over and over again, we actually have to center the people who are suffering doubly and triply from these crises. If our solutions do not intersectionally involve race, gender and gender identity, disability, both physically and mentally, LGBTQ identity, if all of those things are not considered when we build solutions for housing insecurity or whatever issue we're working on today, we will not get there in total. White supremacist dominant culture has taught us that efficiency is more important than sufficiency and I'm here to correct that misnomer. That moving fast doesn't mean all that much if we don't actually create solutions that work for everyone when we get there. We have to put people first enough to consider the contours of how homelessness and housing insecurity shows up differently for everyone. It shows up differently for veterans. It shows up differently sometimes for indigenous folks. It shows up differently for disabled folks. That doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them it does mean that we have to be careful and intentional and intersectional in our solution building. The solutions will be insufficient if they are not intersectional. Lastly, before we open up the conversation, I started off by talking about the fact that the choir definitely needs preaching too. There's this song in my faith tradition called Encourage Yourself, and I have found myself trying to do that a lot over the last couple of days that in this protracted fight for racial justice that has been happening over generations, it would be untrue to say that we never get tired. It would be untrue in this fight to end homelessness and housing insecurity to say that we never get weary. It would be untrue to say that in this fight to create justice and equity for every single person in the world, because all of us deserve it, and the divinity and humanity in all of us should be acknowledged by every system we encounter. But that fight, that fight can wear us out. The other day after the passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I felt like I was encountering so much cynicism. I was encountering so much despair and disillusionment in what is possible because it seems like we, we who stand up for justice are having a tough time catching a break. So I started to journal a little bit and I shared the following affirmation on social media because it was what I needed to hear for myself and I thought maybe somebody else needed a little bit of that light too. I said, I choose the discipline of hope over the ease of cynicism. I choose fortitude over fatalism. I choose to be who my ancestors protected and my creator formed. I choose strategy and organizing as the container for my anger. And I choose to be more than a conqueror. 
these affirmations are not slight and they are not meaningless. We always have to remind ourselves of who we are. That we are people of courage and consciousness. That we are people of bravery and belief. That we will choose that tomorrow can be better because we will go and make it so. And instead of falling victim to this cynicism that I understand is so tempting in this moment, that we choose what Miriam Kaba calls the discipline of hope instead. That we actually get about the business of creating the world as it can be instead of just accepting the world as it is. I believe that the moral arc of the universe does in fact bend toward justice as Dr. King said, because I'm grateful to have learned from and stand next to and work with the people who bend it every single day. We are benders. We are builders. We are people who unapologetically put our hands to the plow and keep pushing until we can't push anymore. What I know to be true beyond the fact that there's no new way forward if we're not truthful about how we get here and beyond the fact that the solutions will be insufficient if they are not intersectional, I know that we cannot win if we are not well. So I encourage you, if you can't find your light, to go and find somebody who can share some of theirs. If you have a little bit of extra light that you found, to shine it on somebody else who needs it. That in community, we find our strength. In collaboration, we find the affirmation and the confirmation that yes, we can keep going and yes, we will win. I know what it looks like. But I also know I am descended of people who, even though their circumstances were ones of enslavement, could actually imagine freedom and then went and fought for it. I am descended of people that, as Nanny Helen Burroughs said about the Black women for whom she built a school in Washington, D.C., that we specialize in the holy impossible. That all of us are descended of people who looked at the current circumstances and decided to press through them anyway, onward to a new frontier that was more free for all of us. And if they could do it, we can do it. That if they did it, we have to do it. So many of them did far more uh, than we have to now with far less than we have available to us. We have an opportunity in front of us to stop apologizing for wanting everyone to experience justice, for wanting everyone to experience equity, for letting people steal our narrative and cast us as people who are evil or want to tear down things that are no longer working for everyone. We have the opportunity to redefine our narrative through our behavior and to own proudly and fully being people who believe in righteousness, being people who are on the right side of history and we prove it every day, not just with our words, but with our actions, not just with our talk, but with our deeds. I'm grateful to each of you for choosing to walk toward the dangerous thing and facing it down anyway for being people who choose to put their hands on the plow and pick up the heavy things and make sure that the heavy load isn't just borne by the people who are already suffering the greatest. We have the power that we need to change the world. We are absolutely, as they say, the ones we have been waiting for. So I'm looking forward to getting into this conversation with you about precisely how we do that and how we do it together. Thanks so much. I'm going to um, invite Tierra to the conversation so we can chat a bit. And I know we'll be taking questions from all of you who have uh, decided to tune in with us, which I'm so grateful for. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to take some questions and answers. Yeah, thank you, Brittany. Um, I I'm starting to feel more and more like this was a setup. <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know how I can engage with you without being able to really just like let everything that you just said shower over me, uh, but I'm gonna do my best. So <laughs> thank you so much for all of that, that inspirational talk. Um, you are uh, truly one of the best orators I have had the, <laughs> the privilege to encounter for sure. Um, I know that you say that you come from a, a line of pastors and preachers and I, I also grew up in the church, yeah. but you with your, your natural 
eloquence and conviction, you also give me a lot of like slam poetry vibes. Like, like are, you, are you a poet? You give me a lot of like spoke, some spoken word vibes there. Like there's a cadence with which you speak that just, it, it, it is, um, it's relaxing as well as being inspiring. Thank you. Um, I'm, I, I can consider myself a little bit of a poet adjacent. Um, and I was listening to a poem by Sonia Sanchez called mm. Belly Buttocks and, and Straight Spines. And it reminds me of your TED talk when you talked about seeing Septima Clark and her, her spine being straight up and yeah. she's, seeing, she's in profile. Um, and it reminded me of that. There's a line in that poem that says, you stroll black beyond the stars, star leaping black skinned woman seen from the angle of a camera. Mm -hmm. And we, we're all being seen from angles of a camera right now, but it also reminds me of, in this context of Breonna Taylor, who is a black woman now leaping beyond the stars. And the only way that we've been able to see her is from the angle of a camera, unfortunately. Um, so I wanna, I wanna take that moment and say that I know that it's been a really hard week uh, for everybody and you mentioned that. And um, I wanna ask just, just how are you? You're busy, we, we have yeah. been, you know, going, going through this process and, and trying to grieve in public um, while also continuing to do the work. But, uh, but how are you doing? How are you doing, Brittany? No, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I am, I am, right? Which is, <laughs> which is, uh, which are the words I have. I, I spend so much time thinking about how other people are doing. I sometimes don't know how to answer the question. So, but I, I greatly appreciate it. I think I am, um, trying to make sure that I allow myself to be fully human in this moment. Mm -hmm. Cause that's what the fight, like that's what the fight is for. Right, that all yeah. of these policies, all of these marches, all of these protests, all of the litigation, all of the, all of the narrative creation on television, like all of it, literally all of it, is so that all of us can thrive. Like that is the vision. Right. And thriving means not sacrificing my humanity because of what society expects from somebody like me. So, you know, society expects us to be the mules of the world, as Arneal Hurston yeah. said, to show up for everybody and show up for ourselves last, to never be angry, to never be tired, to never be sad, to never be distraught, but always to have so much strength that we can save everybody, right? This is yeah. the socialization of Black girls. Um, and depending on who you are and what your identity is, there are different ways that you have been socialized to show up in this moment that require you to sacrifice and silence and erase your truth and your yeah. full humanity. And so I'm just kind of like, let my, I'm trying to let myself be when I'm sad, I'm sad. When I have words, I share them, right? When yeah. I, when I don't, I, I've been practicing a lot of silence and solitude lately, not mm -hmm. because of uh, if there's anything wrong necessarily, but because there can be so many inputs and so much chatter that sometimes you yeah. actually just need to be quiet with yourself and just exist. Um, so I'm, I'm pacing myself is the answer. I'm pacing myself. This is yeah. the only yeah. thing on my calendar today with Oh, intention. wow. <laughs> um, kind of it's a miracle, right. but I work seven days a week. So I've, my therapist yeah. is like, you are going to have to start taking at least one day off. And I was like, okay. So this yeah. is the only <laughs> thing on my calendar today. Um, and so I'm going to let myself be and not feel like I need to clean something or put something back in order or write something or give something, yep. but just be. Um, yeah, just because just that be, is the be, whole be point of the fight. How are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. I, you know, I feel a little heavy you know, just to, with everything. And so I, again, I'm also going to take a moment today and just try to un, like, just like lighten myself, right? Just like right. unload. Um, and part of that is being able to have this conversation with you. Uh, I've been following your work for a long time. I'm the reason why we got you. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for that. It's a great honor. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm gonna try to be light too, but I do, I have a couple of um, instructions for the audience here. Uh, one of the reasons why, um, I enjoyed listening to you. And, and one of the reasons why we wanted to have you was because you are such an inspiring speaker. And the thing that I miss about the conference and not having you as a keynote is, is being able to look to the person next to me and know that they're feeling the same yeah. energy that I'm feeling. And so I need everybody right now in the chat to snap, clap, <laughs> uh, let everybody know, give Brittany the applause that is so well-deserved. 
uh, I need I need my chat to go crazy right now. But also moving yeah. forward, you know, Brittany, Brittany can't go three sentences without dropping a jewel or a gem. So throughout this conversation, I, I also <laughs> listen, okay, take it, take it, just take it. <laughs> Thank you. Girl, just take it. Uh, I also need everybody when you hear something that resonates with you, that inspires you, uh, snap, chat, uh, drop a gem or a jewel or an applause in the chat. Uh, I want to make sure that you all are listening and that you are, you're getting uh, what we want you to get out of this conversation. Um, we don't have a lot of time and I know if I don't get to my questions, then my team is going to be really upset. With me. Okay. So, <laughs> I will be concise. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so Brittany, you've had a, a long and illustrious career, uh, you know, from Ferguson to now. We there's a sense of urgency in the air. And aside from the obvious, you know, the, the current occupant of the White House, which, which you like to call him, uh, I, I really want to ground us in, in, 20, in the moment in 2020 right now and in the urgency that we all have to act. And uh, I want you to tell us a little bit uh, how you feel things have changed from, from your time on the ground in Ferguson to, to now in 2020. What do you feel has changed in the, in the country and society? Um. Well, most certainly we are having fundamentally different conversations. In 2014, I think much of the conversation around police violence and racialized violence was steeped in this belief about bad apples, that every incident was an aberration and that, uh, you know, it was the rare example of a police officer that went overboard that caused the deaths of people like Michael Brown or Eric Garner or Sandra Bland. But what is true and what we have been saying, frankly, for generations and, I, and what a lot, a lot of my colleagues and I have been saying at least since 2014, is that this is systemic. I talk all the time about understanding, if you understand the roots of the tree, you can understand the fruits of the tree. And policing is an institution that is rooted in the protection of white property, including and especially when black people were that white property. So if you root an institution in those kinds of practices, in patrolling and um, collecting enslaved people and returning them back to plantations, right? If that's what the roots of your work were, then it's easy, frankly, to understand why we are where we are. It's easy to understand why we see fully armored police officers going out to protect property that is insured and can be replaced. But that same institution takes over a thousand lives every single year in this country as if people are not more valuable than property. Even the grand jury conclusion in the case of Breonna Taylor's murder is reflective of this point because the officer got charged for the bullets that went into the wall of the white neighbor's apartment. That there is no charge for recklessly endangering the black neighbors on the other side or for murdering a young black woman. So literally the drywall on the white side of the apartment was more valuable than her life. We get this message over and over again, and it's high time that we listen, right? So what I think is more true now is that people are using phrases like systemic racism. They're using phrases like institutional oppression. We're understanding that it's not bad apples, that it is a rotten system. And that if the roots, if the rot is coming from the roots, then we can't just keep picking off the bad apples. We actually have to uproot the tree and plant something new. And we have to, I think the other thing that people are doing a much better job of understanding in this moment is that what we were talking about as it applies to police violence applies to the violence of poverty. It applies to mm -hmm. homelessness. It applies to educational inequity. It applies to the carceral state. It applies to the food apartheid system. Like it applies to literally everything. These same principles of who has the power and who doesn't and the lengths they are willing to go to to retain said power instead of share it. 
that can be mapped onto any injustice that we face, any injustice that we're passionate about, and it's the same equation every time. I think people get that in a way that they didn't in 2014. Mm -hmm. And I think lastly, people therefore, because they understand just how deep and pervasive this is, people are more willing to go for things that sound radical, but that actually are just right. So we could not have said defund the police in 2014, A, because we were all still evolving in our politic and learning and understanding, but also because people weren't quite ready to hear it. And I remind people in this moment that there are precedents for abolition in this country that I, I talked about my enslaved ancestors being the reason why I am free and that they dreamed of abolition when it was impossible. The Declaration of Independence very clearly states that if an institution is not serving the rights of the people, then it is our right to alter or abolish it. That those are the literal words, alter or abolish. And that if if you, you know, ascribe to the beliefs and the personhood of people like Thomas Jefferson and the folks that some people might call founding fathers, that the entire point of them leaving Britain and coming here was to right. free themselves, was liberation, was abolition right. of systems that did not work for them and the creation of ones that did work for them. So these, this idea is not without precedent. Um, and it is most certainly not impossible. And I think there's much more readiness for people to at least begin to hear and process these ideas now than there was in 2014. And that took a lot of work and commitment and sacrifice from thousands of people in multiple industries, including y'all, to make that happen. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. Um, what you said a little bit earlier was the, the all of these systems that are intersecting that create homelessness and, and the need for us to actually work together to be able to reimagine a new system. Uh, you know, we have an audience here of a lot of service providers, uh, a lot of advocates, that come from different fields, right? So, so yeah, the education system, yes, the criminal justice system. Um, and, and right now we all have this, uh, this sort of mission, this, this, tunnel, this tunnel vision for our mission. And we haven't really been successful in building these cross-sector collaborations with each other. Um, I want you to, to try to talk to our providers about how we can do that effectively uh, and not try to compete with each other for these resources uh, but understand that to get to the root of a lot of these problems, uh, you have to build that cross-sector collaboration. It's, it's not just a broad stroke solution, like build housing to end yeah. homelessness, it's getting to the root, the root cause, which is yeah. all of these other institutions that intersect. That's a fantastic question. And I think that some of it is socializing exactly what you just said. There is power in realizing <laughs> how the rules have been rigged against you. Right. I mean, we've all had those light bulb moments. It might have come from a book. You might have been listening to a talk. You might have been watching a movie, a movie probably directed by Ava DuVernay. Right. Like you, there are so many moments that we have the, the light bulb that goes off. Mm -hmm. Right. And that awakening, those light bulb moments are powerful. That's why we call them epiphanies, because they are discoveries that can lead to so much more. And I think for, I, I remember having the epiphany of recognizing that, oh my gosh, systems of white supremacy benefit from marginalized people remaining in competition with each other. Mm -hmm. And that if our issues are in competition and our communities are in competition and our people are in competition, then we are busy fighting over the scraps that we were left with. Cause they do not want us to link arm in arm and start to turn and realize that there's a feast in the other room and we haven't been invited, right? So mm -hmm. some of it is about socializing the truth so that people can have the epiphany that says, we are genuinely stronger together. Lilla Watson said, who's an Aboriginal activist, she said, if you have come here to help me, then you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because you realize that our fates are bound up with one another, mm -hmm. then let us work together. Fannie Lou Hamer said, none of us are free until all of us are free, right? If we think like that and we help our loved ones and our partners and our would-be collaborators think like that, so is a man thinketh, so is he. It's a lot easier to actually 
operating that. So one of it is to, one of the solutions I think is to socialize exactly what you're talking about and like shout it from every single rooftop we have. The other thing I think is to um, learn critically from where we are doing this well, that I have watched, um, you know, my, so my friend Jose Lopez, we sat on President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force together. He works um, for an organizing collective called Make the Road in New York. And yeah, I'll never forget it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, fantastic work, right? I'll never yeah. forget him talking about the basic premise of partnership that so many people skip over when they're organizing. And so, you know, Make the Road is out here helping get laws passed in Albany about everything from schooling to policing and da 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 da. But he was like, we got the people on our side and ready to canvas and ready to meet with elected officials and ready to march and ready to protest and ready to work and organize. We got people on our side ready to do all of that because we helped them get a stop sign in the neighborhood. Like we Mm -hmm. invested in the things that they said were important to them before we asked anything of them. So the best way to get a friend is to be a friend. And if you are wanting collaboration in your industry and space, if you are wanting support for your bill or your advocacy or your work, people are right to ask you, how are you showing up for our stuff, right? When we actually get to the work of collaborating and operating in solidarity with one another, providing and being generous with the resources that we have and sharing our power amongst them, amongst ourselves, we can actually build the muscle of doing that, right? The, the more you practice, the more you get better. So we have an opportunity in front of us, I think, to practice the kind of power sharing that we want to be true in the world as we build it. I like that you're, you're building the muscle and then you're making it stronger. And one of the ways that we should be doing that, and I think that as a community, we need to get better at is building a friend with the impacted people, with the people who are the most impacted by the policies that we are trying to change or enact. That's right. Um, And as a culture, as a society overall, but you know, in the world of advocacy, we we tend to say that we are representing or working for instead of collaborating with. And um, I want you to speak to that just a little bit. So there's two prongs to this question actually. One is like, how can we be better collaborators with people who are impacted when we are sort of at this, this, mid-level, you know, no longer grassroots. Some of us yeah. are, are sort of at, at this uh, mid-level, mid-level. Yeah. How do we engage them in our, our actual everyday work and then uh, motivate them to interact with systems that have been designed to harm them and oppress them? Get them engaged civically when they, they feel that the, the government actually doesn't even actually work for them or there have been so many barriers for them actually being able to do that. So it's two-pronged, mm-hmm. but it's about those... Uh, that impact a population that we are supposed to be collaborating with and serving? I mean, I would even, I think it's just the question to be asking right now. And I would even push it even further to say, not just how are we collaborating, but how are we following the lead of the most impacted, right? And I know that that's what you mean, right? And so there's a, you know, I used to run an education nonprofit and when I took over for for the executive director that came before me, I got a list of, like a hundred people. And he was like, these are the people you have to meet with right now. And I was like, okay. So I look at the list. It is, everybody on the list is rich. (laughs) None of the people on the list send their kids to the schools that we serve. Mm -hmm. Nearly all of the people on the list are white. Nearly all of the people on the list are male. So I was like, okay, thank you for this advice. (laughs) Gonna set it to the side. Um, and I get it. We all need to raise money to keep our doors open. I've had to, as as somebody who's had to raise a lot of money before, I get it. But I said, if we're here to try to be one of the levers that can be pulled to help solve educational inequity in this region, and to be clear, the region was St. Louis, it was my hometown. So it was like that much more important to me. If the point of us is that we're supposed to be useful to the work of ending educational inequity, then the conversation begins and ends with the people who are dealing with educational inequity, the students, the parents, the guardians and caregivers that we serve every single day. So the people I met with first and consistently were them. 
The people next on my tier were the people that they trust, the pastors and imams, the, the school principals that they like and that they respect, the, the longtime educators and retired educators who've been doing this work since before I got into it. My next tier of people were folks across industries who were doing justice work, whether or not it was in education. Because I want to understand how what you're doing that affects the students that I'm trying to serve, like how are you approaching this? Because they're coming to your dental clinic. They're coming to your after school program. They're coming to your church. They're coming to this shelter. I want to know how you all are doing what you do so that I can understand how I'm working with you and how I can do my job better based on what they're dealing with. Then I'm gonna go talk to the rich people, right? Like that was literally the order and we maintained yep. that order. Um, my, my support staff on that team, we had a target every single week and we literally color coded my calendar according to who I was engaged with. Is this a community mm -hmm. engagement? Is this a student engagement? Is this a donor engagement? Is this a government engagement? And I could look immediately in my calendar. If there was too much blue on it, it means I wasn't talking to the right people, right? We had percentages right. that said, you should, 40% of your meetings should be with people who are directly impacted or, or who are directly working in the system. So that's teachers, parents, and students. If I'm not spending 40, at least 40% of my time there every single week, then I'm not doing my job. Um, right. And so like that, it is, it has to be that literal, that specific and that clear. Cause otherwise we're giving a lot of nice rhetoric that sounds good, but that never shows up in practice. And what happened because I started to build relationships with those folks is that when I wasn't showing up as the way I was talking about it, if I wasn't being about it that way, they were like, um, excuse me, hold you accountable. Yep. <laughs> this is not what you said. Right. When we started off, we were doing yeah. this and now you're doing this. So how do we get back on track? Mm -hmm. The accountability helped me be a better leader. The accountability helped me be of better service to my own community. Um, and so I just think that like we have to literally audit our practices yes. and keep reconstituting them and refining them until we get yes. to the point where habitually we are following the lead of the people who are most impacted. That also means that we have to disabuse ourselves of what their vision should sound like. That we have to stop thinking that it has to show up in a PowerPoint presentation or over a Zoom call or with these words, you have to know this bill, or you have to speak this jargon, or you have to be in support of this particular candidate. Like, stop all of that. Listen yep. to what people's hopes and dreams and visions are for their own lives and their own communities. And then ask yourself the literal question, how can I be of service to that? What gifts, talents, resources, capital do I have to be in service of that? If I'm doing anything that's not in service of that, it's not the right work. Preach. I told y'all, I told y'all, I hope y'all dropping jewels in the chat over there. Um, this, this, this brings me to my next question, and then we're going to go ahead and do a quick Q&A. Um, you, you talk about learning in public, right? And, and we are, you're, you're making mistakes and you're holding yourself accountable in public. Um, you know, our, our, a lot of our organizations are, are led by white folks who got into this field because they, they wanted to get into a field of care and compassion. Uh, but right now, as we all are sort of grappling with addressing systemic racism and, 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 you know, fascism and racism being very overt. Um, they they want to give space to Black people, but are, uh, but might be afraid and be allies, but might be afraid of saying the wrong thing, yeah. um, showing up in the wrong way. Um, I, I, I want you to be able to speak to that a little bit, right? Like, how, how can we, uh, and I don't want to say help white people be allies, but, uh, you know, just, just speak to that a little bit. <laughs> I don't yeah. want to be quiet before I, <laughs> but I think, you get, I think you get where I'm going with yep. this, right? Okay. I mean, I, so two things and I'll be quick because I want to make sure we get questions from the audience. Um, the first thing is the aspiration should always to be, to move from ally to accomplice and accomplice to conspirator, to co-conspirator. An ally is somebody who shows up when it is convenient. An accomplice is somebody who's willing to take a risk. 
and a co-conspirator is so deep in it with you that they're willing to put it all on the line to help you plan the whole thing in the first place mm. right mm. so fix that in your mind as you are trying to figure out how you show up and i like to call myself an aspiring co-conspirator to the communities of which i am not a part which brings me to my second point never be above correction the correction can be painful especially if it's public and you get dragged all over Twitter. I have been there. I'm still standing. I'm still surviving. It's okay. <laughs> right? It is. But if you are above correction, then you're nobody's ally because the people that you right. claim to stand in solidarity with, that you claim to want to be a co-conspirator to, if they are telling you something, it is literally your first and foremost responsibility to listen and adapt. So to put my own self on, um, on, the, on the summer jam screen, as it were, I re a couple of years ago, <laughs> this was 2016, Trump was running for president. He made fun of a disabled reporter. I tweeted that he made fun of a differently abled reporter. Now, mm -hmm. there were roots to why I was using that particular term. I, um, my, my father was in a wheelchair for the last few years of his life when I was an adolescent, and that was the word I was taught to use, right? Language evolves though, and most importantly, marginalized people should be able to self-determine their own future, which means that if disabled people are saying they want the word disability to be used, then it is my responsibility to use the word that they chose for themselves, right? right. I didn't know. I was genuinely ignorant to this. I got dragged left and right all over Twitter. And you know what? I can't be mad at them for that. Like right. I don't get to police your tone given how much pain you may have endured at the hands of folks who are perpetuating ableism all over the all over the place right especially folks with a platform like myself right mm -hmm. um i can't i can't dictate how you respond when you're the one living with the marginalized identity so instead of me saying well why didn't you just say it a different way or you could have dm'd me or you got my phone mm -hmm. number or da 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 I had to move my own ego out of the way and saying, what is the lesson that I am responsible to receive and, and adapt based on from this conversation? So A, I offered an apology. B, the best apology is changed behavior. So I have used the word disabled since then, but even more, I have mm -hmm. gone beyond that. And I said, okay, clearly there are, there are, there's an agenda and, and there are needs and, and vision in the disabled community. And if I'm going to be of service and of partnership and stand in solidarity, then I need to be much more actively learning what those things are. So I went and audited my Twitter feed. I realized I was not following a lot of people who are disabled, who are disabled mm -hmm. activists, who are disabled speakers, who are disabled industry leaders. So I went and I followed a bunch of folks I went to a, I realized that there was a, this was when we could still go outside, that there was a conference on disability near close to my home that was coming up in the next couple of weeks. And a number of the people that I had now followed were gonna be speaking. And people were like, well, we can get you a free registration. No, I can afford to pay my registration. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pay you for your labor. I paid for my registration. When I sat in people's sessions, I donated to their organizations, right? So like, if I truly aspire to be a co-conspirator of you, to you, then I have to listen and adapt when you have correction for me. If you can't be, if you are above correction, <laughs> then you're not ready to be an ally. And I, I would, let alone an accomplice or a co-conspirator, and I would encourage you to revisit some of your baggage. So, yeah, so I think the most important thing is don't be afraid. And if you get corrected, you got to take it. Um, all right, we are going to, let's see, or I should have asked somebody else to do this with the, uh, with the questions here. Let's see, where are they mostly? I think most of them are in okay. the Q&A section, maybe, like if you click on Q&A. Well, you know what, I because I done told everybody to put all of their applause in the chat. Oh, <laughs> so I got you, I got you. Like, yes, yes, <laughs> that. Uh, all right, let's see. Um, all right, so here's this question, white saviorism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, okay. Here, wait, I'm... So what, what, do you, what do you say about white saviorism? I have a friend who's a white man. He's for a cause and always actively participating in protests, but he's always advocating online or in person. He doesn't seem to take mental health breaks effectively. 
self-care is important. So, so doing too, doing a little too much maybe, yeah. with that, with that attitude. Yeah. So, you know, I, I don't know your friends, so I don't know if that's white saviorism or if that is, um, as we call it grind culture, because in this capitalist space, we think that working too much is, a is, um, the, it should be the aspiration which is wild, especially when you think about the fact that the people who are working the hardest are making the least, but that's a, another conversation. Um, so I don't know what the roots of it are, but what I will say, um, as a reminder, I think to all of us, Audre Lorde says that caring for myself is not self-indulgence, it is self-preservation, and that is an mm -hmm. act of political warfare. So those of us who have marginalized identities, and those of us who are aspiring co-conspirator on issues of injustice, like I said in my remarks, we cannot win if we are not well. And if all of us peter out, right, and burn out, um, then like who, who is left to do the work? Um, I say all the time that we build teams and not saviors because we have the opportunity to get more free when we broaden and expand the space for everybody to show up with what they have to offer. So there are plenty of things that I am capable of doing. And there are plenty of things that I am not capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And I need somebody else in their gift and their talent and their expertise and their with their resources with their access to show up and fill in the gaps that I can't fill. Um, and the bigger the team gets, the bigger the choir gets, the louder we can sing together, the more we can get done. That means that I have to move my own ego out of the way for long enough to consider who can do something better, who is already doing something, who ha is doing something from which I can learn, and who else needs to be on the team. Um, and so it's, it can be a, a saviorism complex period to, to think that you have to be the one to do and say everything, whether you're white or not. Um, and I encourage all of us to remember that it is teams and not individual saviors that will actually set us free. Uh, there was a question here about protesting being an effective uh, strategy for change. How do you how do you feel about that? Especially um, now, you know, I've seen I've seen your progression uh, to you seem to have a seat at the table. Um, how do you feel about sort of the pr protesting as a form of ad advocacy here or effective strategy for change? And that's going to be our final question. And then I want you to um, I want you to speak directly to to black women at the end as, okay. as your goodbye. OK, yeah, um, a, a friend of mine who I don't even know where the book is. Uh, a friend of mine who uh, plays for the NBA asked me a very similar question. Because he's like, what should I be doing here, right? Like, should I be mm -hmm. going to protest? Mm -hmm. Should I be supporting protesters? Should I be putting money in bail funds? Or is this a question about policy and having a seat at the table and sitting where decisions are being made and influencing decisions? And I was like, hey, friends, it's a both and. Like yeah. all the important things in life, it is a both and. I encouraged him to read um, Dr. King's um, Where Do We Go From Here is Here, but I encouraged him to, mm -hmm. gosh, what is the other one? The, suddenly the title is escaping my head. It is upstairs. Um, but I think letter that there- Letter from there, a Birmingham he, jail. I'm, well, yes, Letter from a Birmingham jail. I, I remind mm -hmm. people to read all the time and that's actually where I was coming. So we can just go there while I try to remember okay. the other name of this book. I cannot believe this. Oh, why we can't wait, why we can't wait. Good God, I don't know why I could think of that. I've heard it like four <laughs> times. Anyway, um, he talks frequently in his writing, including the letter from a Birmingham jail, which is a great place to start this conversation. Uh, he talks frequently about the importance of creating the crisis that forces power structures to answer that none of the folks in power are going to sit at the table and negotiate anything with us unless and until we make them. And that is what disciplined nonviolent direct action does. That is what protest does. That is what being on the streets does. It forces folks to pay attention. And we have seen it work over and over again in our world's history that there are Supreme Court decisions and laws that have been passed and folks that have gotten elected and regimes that have come down because people took to the streets and they continued to organize that power 
with every lever they had access to. So when I sat on the on President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force, I told them when they contacted me and started to vet me, I said, if the expectation is that I stop protesting, then you should go find somebody else. Mm -hmm. Because my job is to help extend the power that is building on the streets that made this task force relevant, <laughs> right? And, and created in the, that helped create this task force in the first place. My job is to help extend the power from the streets to this table. And I can't speak truthfully to what my community wants if I'm not standing next to them. So I was like, if that's the expectation, then please, no, I can't join. They assured me that was not, they were like, that's, we're not protest busters. I was like, great, and we can, we can do this. Um, right. But there is a, I, I encourage us always to remember that it is never ever about the either or, it is always about the both and. How can we use every lever at our disposal to get justice done? Period, end of story. Um, I will close, because I know we are at time, uh, with a word to Black women. I am grateful to you. I am grateful for how you have seen me and how you have raised me. I am grateful for you being a safe space and a brave space. I am grateful that you expect my evolution when I make mistakes. I am grateful that you embrace my evolution when it comes. I'm grateful for more than you just saving us from ourselves over and over again. I am grateful for us being the heartbeat of so many of the things that are good and right about this world. I am grateful that we exist. I am grateful that we shine. I am grateful that we create. I'm grateful that we thrive. I'm grateful that we reflect light from the highest places, even in the midst of the dark. And I am grateful in knowing that black women are so much more than the moment that we are in. So don't ever let anybody treat us like a trend. Don't let anybody ever treat us like we are less valuable than the property they own or that we are the property that they own. Don't let anybody tell you or us that we are not worth every single thing that we desire and that we don't deserve to be every single place that we stand. We do. We are love, we are light, we are more than worthy, and we are more than conquerors. I love you, Black girls. I see you, and I thank you. Brittany, thank you so, thank you so much. Everybody, you can follow Brittany on social media, and Miss Pat Yeti. Um, what, what else, you, where can they find you, Brittany? That, that your uh, website, Miss, you can Brittany find Pat anything, Pat. it's yeah. BrittanyPacnet.com and Miss Pat Getty. Yeah. Anything, any way you there need you to go. get in touch there with me go. is right there. Oh, Brittany, we are so, so grateful for you. Please enjoy the rest of your Friday. Get some Thank rest you. to fight another day. Um, truly, it was an honor to chat with you. I wish we had more time, but alas, No, thank you for the work that you do <laughs> and for this beautiful conversation and Thank you to everyone working in supportive housing in New York and beyond to make sure that um, we continue to treat people with the dignity they deserve. Yeah, uh, everyone, you can follow the network at the Network NY on Twitter and Instagram. This this uh, conversation will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel. You can find it on our website. All of the good stuff. Um, follow us. Follow Brittany. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go now. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank Thanks so everyone. Much. Thanks for joining. Bye.